Hello everybody, Stupid Studios in here, and welcome to part 2 of our Yu-Gi-Oh! Eternal Duel Assault Challenge run, where our goal is to beat all 24 opponents in the game while only using the deck of Yu-Gi's best friend and chronic gambling addict, Joey Wheeler. If you haven't seen part 1, I'd recommend clicking the info card at the top to catch up to speed on where we're at. Otherwise, to recap, last time we challenged the first 12 duelists in the game and showed just how well Joey's deck was able to stand up against them. Surprisingly, it went a lot better than expected, as only two of those 12 opponents put up any tangible resistance. But we're past the halfway point now, so I expect this is where the game's going to give us a bit more grief, and knowing what I'll need to do later on in order to progress, I mean that in more ways than one. Anyway, picking up from where we left off last time, next up for our stage 3 opponents is Strings, and they're definitely one of the more unique duelists here. Seeing as the jam cards aren't in this game and neither are the Egyptian gods, well, functionally at least, we won't be seeing any shenanigans involving Slifer the Sky Dragon here. Rather, Merrick's Puppet plays a straight mill deck, taking advantage of Triple Morphing Jar to make both players draw 5 after discarding their hand, Needleworm to send the top 5 cards off our deck to the graveyard, and the Bistro Butcher, an 1800 attack point monster that activates Pot of Greed for the other player when it inflicts battle damage. I'm sure that little detail won't bite him in the ass at all. Strings is also on Penguin Knight, which, while it's not a card we'll need to seriously worry about, it has probably the most powerful sounding line of card text ever printed, at least until the release of Volt Tester in 2019. When it's sent from deck to graveyard by an opponent's card effect, the card's owner is asked to unite their graveyard cards in their own deck, shuffle them, and form a new deck. Make of that description what you will. But anyway, aside from some random life point burning and healing cards, there really isn't much else to write home about with the spell and trap lineup, so on with the duel. We go second, and after firing off a graceful charity, we're only forced to contend with a set monster and back row from strings. We set the monster reborn in Heavy Storm in our opening hand, not wanting them to be discarded off a potential morphing jar, then go for an attack with our dragon zombie. It turns out not to be a Morphing Jar, but instead a Witch of the Black Forest, letting Strings search out a Summoned Skull. Remember this for later. Strings is turned again, and they fire off Harpy's Feather Duster, punishing our play from last turn. To rope salt in the wound, they then go ahead and activate Pot of Greed. However, fortunately for us, Strings acts generously by summoning the Bistro Butcher and attacks into our Dragon Zombie, which lets us activate Pot of Greed as well. We draw a Swamp Battle Guard and Alligator Sword off this effect. Our turn again, and without a monster to contest Strings' Butcher, we send Hero of the East along with our Magic Jammer. Strings is able to get over our monster with DD Warrior, banishing both cards in the process, and attacks again with the Bistro Butcher, procking the Pot of Greed effect again, getting his skulls both summoned and dice. Setting our skull dice, we summon Alligator Sword with the intent of hopefully getting a 3 or higher so Strings' Bistro Butcher can't beat over our monster. Unfortunately, this gamble doesn't pan out well for us as we end up rolling a 1 off skull dice. So yeah, Pot of Greed again. Well, at least we draw drawn out this time. Battle Steer isn't something we can use, but Raigeki at least helps us clear out the Bistro Butcher. We then attack directly with Tiger Axe and set a Magical Arm Shield. Strings then throws out a Raigeki of their own and summons fucking Penguin Knight to attack us with. I uh, guess he ran out of good monsters at least? Thinking that next turn I can force him to run into our Magical Arm Shield, I summon Hitatsumi Giant and pass turn. This, however, would prove to be my boldest display of arrogance this duel, as I am immediately reminded of the summoned skull in his hand from turn 2 and have our monster destroyed as a result. While this wouldn't immediately spell the end of the game for us, we can only stave off the bleeding for one more turn with Tariki before Strings is able to close out the game from here. Well, that last attempt went poorly. You'd think activating Pot of Greed three times over the course of one duel would just be an auto-win, but I guess bad luck and just generally not paying attention to the game state overrides any level of draw power you could possibly have. Hopefully attempt two can go a bit better. Strings gets to go first again, setting a monster into backer before passing over to us, and our hand doesn't look too great, being mostly comprised of monsters this time. I decide to set Magical Arm Shield and attack into the face down with Battle Warrior, hoping for a Morphing Jar. We're instead met with Witch of the Black Forest by attacking to the set. Huh. Getting a weird sense of deja vu here. In any case, our battle warrior can't get over it, so Strings doesn't get to search a monster, but we take 500 damage as a result. Strings then summons Dark Elf and proceeds to attack with Witch first. Here we get to properly execute the plan we had on the first attempt of the duel, activating Magical Arm Shield and forcing Witch to swing into their Dark Elf. The battle damage allows Strings to activate their set Numinos Healer, recovering 1000 life points, and Witch gets to search Summon Skull. However, tributing for a Summon Skull of her own, they'll have to work a bit harder to get theirs on board as we're able to take out their Dark Elf. Strings sets a monster, which ends up being DD Warrior, and thankfully we find this out by attacking attacking into it with Beaver Warrior and not the monster we actually want to keep around. After this, Strings decides to go for a Monster Reborn, bringing back Dark Elf to defense position, and sets a monster, which I assume is to set up a defense against our metaphorical battering ram. This ultimately doesn't matter though, as we draw off the top for our next turn, Pot of Greed! But it's not the draw 2 that matters, but the contents of that draw 2, and boy were those two cards something else, Raigeki and Monster Reborn to be exact. As expected, with only 5100 life points left and no more back row to threaten us, we're quick to blow up their Dark Elf and set Bistro Butcher. We then revive Dark Elf and Normal Summon Panther Warrior to overwhelm them with a sum total of 6500 damage. Yeah, I think that makes up for the embarrassment that was the first game. 
Well, moving on from strings, we're put up against Lumis and Umbra. Despite technically being up against two opponents, this and many of the other early Yu-Gi-Oh games don't support tag dueling as an option. A complete travesty that would be rectified six times over with the PSP's Tag Force series. So for all intents and purposes, we're still just fighting one guy here. Also, as is par for the course with the Battle City duelists at this point, they lack many of the cards they actually used in the anime and manga. In fact, the only one of their cards that is present in the game, Mask of Darkness, isn't even present in their deck here. Kind of defeats the point of having them around, wouldn't you think? But I digress. The duo his main strategy seems to revolve around keeping us from attacking by using high defense tribute monsters like Labyrinth Wall, Millennium Golem, and the McDonald's classic Millennium Shield. I'm sure Loomis was excited to pull that in the booster pack that came with his Happy Meal. Their deck is also supplemented by many of the high attack monsters and flip monsters we've seen so far, now incorporating Hane Hane as a sort of discount penguin soldier. And there's also Shadow Ghoul, which gains 100 attack for every monster in their graveyard, which can be dangerous for us, especially if played in the late game. The spell cards are all ones we've seen so far, but the trap lineup adds a new card we haven't seen up until this point widespread. Ruin. On attack declaration, it destroys the monster with the highest attack value on our side of the field, so yeah, it's sort of a discount mirror force. Annoying, but nothing too impressive. Anyway, for the duel itself, our opponents go first, setting a monster before passing the turn over, and on our turn, we find that our hand is loaded with trap cards, which would be amazing if we weren't playing against a defense centric strategy, but hey, maybe they can come in handy. In any case, we set all the spells and traps in our hand to play around Morphing Jar, and thankfully, Heavy Storm is the only spell trap destruction they run, so I feel pretty confident in this move. We attack into a set wall of illusion with Mystic Horsemen and pass on a board with no monsters, but enough defensive options to keep us from auto-losing here. We take a little under half our total life points and damage from both Wall of Illusion and Gemini Elf attacking directly, but on the following turn we set Blackland Fire Dragon and activate Magical Arm Shield when Lewis and Umbra attempt to attack into it, which buys us another turn. Off the top we draw Graceful Charity and fire it off immediately, drawing Sword of Dragon Soul, Red Eyes Black Dragon, and Hero of the East. We discard Baby Dragon and Red Eyes from our hand, then proceed to destroy the now attack position Wall of Illusion with Hero of the East. Skipping around a bit, the pair of our hunters are able to summon Gemini Elf number 2, and this forces out our Mirror Force so we don't die there immediately. On their next turn, Monster Reborn is fired off, attempting to bring back our Red Eyes, but luckily we have our set Magic Jammer able to prevent that from happening. Eventually though, Loomis and Umbra summon out Vorse Raider, which we change apart on our following turn, and use it as tribute for Summon Skull. Though this advantage doesn't last long, however, as after firing off Pot of Greed, they set a monster, and when we attack into it with Hitatsumi Giant, we find out it's Penguin Soldier bouncing back both of our monsters. With nothing left to defend ourselves with, they swing in for lethal using their second horse raider. That duel probably could have been won had I been a bit less conservative with Mirror Force early on, or sequenced the Magical Arm Shield differently, but there's really no use crying over spilled milk at this point. We get to go first this time, and while our opening hand doesn't have literally every trap in our deck as it did last time, we still have Magical Arm Shield, so we set that along with the summon of Panther Warrior. I quickly find out that maybe it's for the best that we didn't have all of our traps, as Heavy Storm is quickly thrown our way before Loomis and Number set a monster. In any case, we draw Swamp Battle Guard and proceed to attack into their set monster with Hitatsumi Giant. This is met with a widespread ruin, destroying our Panther Warrior, but ultimately that doesn't matter as the set card turns out to be Cyber Jar, blowing up the board anyways. We end up drawing Monster Reborn, Lava Battle Guard, Polymerization, Magic Jammer, and the Sword of Dragon's Soul. Wow, literally no monsters we can summon off that, huh? On the flip side, Loomis and Umbra get Labyrinth Wall, Hane Hane, Vorse Raider, Spellbinding Circle, and Pot of Greed. We set our Magic Jammer, Polymerization, and Sword, then pass it back, no longer needing to fear backer removal from our opponent. And from here we spend the next few turns steadily attempting to chew through their board. We take a bit of damage from their Vorse Raider in the process, but drawing Mirror Force allows us to clear up their side of the field. We're able to attack directly with Alligator Sword, but Loomis and Umbra counter by using their Pot of Greed, which, uh, I guess they were hesitant on using it first. Though their strategy makes a bit more sense when I negate it with Magic Jammer, only to see them follow it up with Monster Reborn. They bring back our Panther Warrior, just attributed for Shadow Ghoul, now boosted to 2200 attack. This gets over our Alligator Sword, but I decide now would be a good time to use a Monster Reborn of our own. Bringing back Hitatsumi Giant, we tribute it for Swamp Battle Guard, but this alone isn't able to get over Shadow Ghoul, however equipping it with Sword of Dragon Soul gives it just the boost we needed. A few more boring turns later, thanks in part to Penguin Soldier setting us back a few monsters, Loomis and Umber activate Swords of Revealing Light, allowing them to eventually put on the board Millennium Golem. Fortunately, we're able to block our life points from being attacked further with Summon Skull, and when Swords expires, are able to get over their golem, only for Summon Skull to get bounced back by Hane Hane. Yep, sure, that's fine, I guess. Several more turns later, with Penguin Soldier and Hane Hane dragging out the duel even longer than it reasonably should go on for, and we're able to get to Pot of Greed, which puts Raigeki in our hands. While our push against their life points gets cut short by the Bistro Butcher, the draw 2 effect gives us Change of Heart. From there, we're able to steal the Butcher, leaving them with no monsters on the field, and allowing us to bring back Summon Skull. While we can't break a glass ceiling from underneath them as much as I would love to for how monotonous that duel was, we're at least able to clean things up from here. 
And for our last opponent on stage three, it's the leader of the rare hunters himself, Merrick Ishtar. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, Merrick's deck is vastly different to the one he used in the anime and manga. While the Winged Dragon of Ra isn't available in its legal printing, as we mentioned in Strings' deck breakdown, none of his anime or manga cards were printed at the time either. Geez, you, you know, I'm starting to get the idea that maybe I should have done Worldwide Edition or World Championship 2004 for this video. We would have at least had a bit more variety in decks to play against. Well, uh, hey, let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in seeing me do at some point. Anyway, the deck resembles less of a burn stall strategy, but instead something almost equally as torturous, hand destruction. The new cards here that are relevant include White Magical Hat, which rips a card out of our hand when it inflicts battle damage, Morphing Jar number 2, which is sort of a worse cyber jar, and Delinquent Duo. Currently residing on the ban list, this card lets you pay a thousand life points to send a random card from your opponent's hand to the graveyard, and if there's still more cards remaining in hand, it rips another one. Oh, and Merrick runs two of them. Whatever you do, shuffle well, and hope with all your soul that the delinquent duos end up on the bottom. As for the other cards, I'm just going to briefly mention them here real quick. Sebek's so Blessing is a quick play spell that lets you gain life points equal to battle damage you take, while White Hole is a track card that blinks the effects of Dark Hole specifically, a card we're not even running in this deck. These cards, especially the latter, won't really be relevant for their effects, but because our opponent can use them to bluff us into thinking it's a set Mirror Force or Trap Hole, and that's pretty much it. Anyway, we get to go first in the duel, and huh. All oh, monsters and magical arm shield. Looking a lot like the hand we had in the previous game. In any case, the first few turns aren't particularly eventful. We mostly just go back and forth with progressively stronger monsters, until about turn 6, where I magical arm shield Merrick's Gemini Elf to stop their Bistro Butcher. We set Tigrax on our following turn, fully expecting to get our board wiped, but instead Merrick summons out a Jinzo number 7, a 500 attack monster that can attack directly regardless of monsters on board. Because of this, Merrick attacks directly for time wizard level damage and only clears one of our two set monsters. After getting over their Jinzo number 7 with Alligator Sword, Merrick sets a monster and lets us keep some degree of board presence. On our following turn, we draw into Graceful Charity, which gets us Panther Warrior, Heavy Storm, and Pot of Greed, which allows us to draw two more cards from the top of our deck to our hand. Er, after we discard Red Eyes Black Dragon and Baby Dragon, of course. This adds for us Swamp Battle Guard and Sword of Dragon Soul. After summoning Panther Warrior and setting our spells to play around any hand destruction effects, we attack into a set Magician of Faith, which can't retrieve a spell since Merrick hasn't used any yet, and then we attack over Gemini Elf, clearing our opponent's board completely. Merrick then returns the favor in one swift move by using Raigeki to blow up our Panther Warrior. This stings even more as Merrick hits us with White Magical Hat, discarding our Axe Raider in the process. Thankfully, we still have Alligator Sword to get over White Magical Hat, and while Merrick uses MST to blow up our Heavy Storm and then Change of Heart to steal our Alligator Sword, he doesn't really capitalize on it, instead setting a monster and hitting us for 1500. We draw a Monster Reborn, but knowing we can't close the game up from this position, I elect to set it and instead swing into a set monster with Alligator Sword, which turns out to be the second Magician of Faith, now able to get Raigeki back for Merrick. Even though Merrick uses Raigeki again, he seemingly ran out of monsters, only setting a backer card before passing back to us. And funnily enough, on our next turn we end up drawing a Raigeki of our own. However, without any monsters we can normal summon without tribute, I decided Monster Reborning Red Eyes Black Dragon is the only way for us to make any tangible progress at this point. Thankfully, the set card was probably White Hole, as attacking directly doesn't activate anything. From here, we're able to clean things up pretty quickly as Merrick sets a monster and we draw Hitatsumi Giant on our last turn, which, after blowing up the set monster, lets us wrap up the duel and stage 3 as a whole with exact lethal. So, with stage 3 down, we subject another tier of duelists to Exodia Turbo, now 3 times each, get jumpscared by a random encounter with the rare hunter while I was recording footage at 2 in the morning, and finally, we're able to move on to tier 4. Before we begin with stage 4, however, since you made it this far in the video, I'd just like to ask for you to leave a like or dislike depending on if you're enjoying the video so far, and to comment below to let me know your thoughts as always. Also, did you know that according to my YouTube analytics, around 67% of my subscribers pour their cereal first and then the milk? I couldn't believe it myself to begin with, but in retrospect I shouldn't be surprised YouTube has that kind of data on us. In any case, I think that's terrible, it should be an even 50-50 split. So, if you want to be notified about whenever I upload and help bring about a perfectly balanced breakfast, consider hitting that subscribe button. Anyhow, let's continue on with the show. Show. While Stage 1 had us battle the main Duel Monsters Quintet, Stage 2 put us up against Joey's Battle City opponents, and Stage 3 had us facing off against Yugi's. Stage 4's theme is a bit vague. The best way I can describe it is as the group with significance to the nameless pharaoh. These of course being Ashizu Ishtar, Shadi, Seto Kaiba, the Spirit of the Millennium Ring, Yami Bakura, and the Spirit of the Millennium Puzzle himself, Yami Yugi. So starting us off, let's set our sights to Shadi for our first duel on this tier. 
And, well, looking at the deck list, it makes a lot of sense as to why this guy never played dual monsters in the anime or manga. Even by this game's standards, Shadi's deck is atrocious, especially for a late game opponent. While he runs Legend, the mystical genie of the lamp, a fairly strong vanilla monster, none of the eight tribute monsters he runs, with the exception of Millennium Golem, are any stronger than Legend in terms of attack. The only new monster worth mentioning here is Banisher of the Light. For all intents and purposes, this card is mystical elf, but with the effect to banish any and all cards sent to the graveyard, it basically prevents us from setting up any monster reborn shenanigans. For the spells, the new ones here include Diane Kito the Cure Master, letting him recover 1,000 life points, which is, uh, kind of irrelevant, frankly, and Tribute to the Doomed, which is at least a pretty decent card, letting Shadi discard a card to destroy a monster on the field. Otherwise, for the traps, while he runs Solemn Judgment, which negates any summon or spell trap activation at the cost of half his life points, the rest of his new traps are hilariously bad. Merrick's deck was basically a premonition of things to come, as on top of White Hole, which does nothing to us, he also runs Call of Darkness, allowing him to negate specifically Monster Reborn, and Anti- Raigeki, which bonus points to the first person who can guess what that thing can only negate. If I see either of those two cards resolved for the rest of this challenge, I swear I will eat a copy of the card it negates. We go second here, but expectedly this duel doesn't last particularly long. Johnny's opening play is just setting a monster while we get to follow him up with the summon of X-Raider and activating Graceful Charity, which finds us Monster Reborn and Mirror Force. After destroying Shadi's set Lord of Zamiya, we get met with a Raigeki on Shadi's next turn, and after attacking in a Magician of Faith, a second Raigeki. However, while Shadi is able to keep us off monsters to an extent using Tribute to the Doomed on our second Alligator Sword, and him stealing our third with Change of Heart, this ultimately doesn't amount to much as he doesn't even tribute it or anything. We find out that the back row wasn't Call of Darkness or Anti-Raigeki, as we're able to use both and quickly dispose of Shadi with Alligator Sword, a revived Axe Raider, and Panther Warrior for game. Well, our first duel for stage 4, and it was kind of a letdown, but if it's a challenge you want, then be careful what you wish for, as Ashizu's deck seems to be the most competently put together deck we've seen so far. While in more recent times, Ashizu was known for terrorizing the metagame with incredibly powerful Earth Fairy monsters in conjunction with the Tier Element archetype, here Ashizu commands a light attribute deck which focuses on using cards to increase the attack of strong low level monsters, not unlike what we saw with Mai and her wind attribute deck. In place of Harpy's Pet Dragon, Ashizu commands two copies of Blue Eyes White Dragon, a card I'm sure needs no introduction though I'm guessing Kaipa decided to put two of his three copies out on a loan to Ishizu, since only three are canonically supposed to exist. Duname Stark Witch and Neo the Magic Swordsman, likewise, fill a role similar to Harpy's brother, being high attack four-star vanilla monsters. And for the effect monsters, Ashizu has a couple of pretty strong ones here. Shining Angel acts as a giant rat, but for light monsters, letting Ashizu special summon one with 1500 or less attack when it's destroyed by battle. Hoshinengen boosts the attack of all light monsters by 500, while reducing the attack of dark monsters by 400. And lastly, what I dare call her true ace card here, Maha Velo, is a light monster with the effect to boost its attack by 500 for each equip spell equipped to it. In conjunction with one of the three copies of Acts of Despair she runs, this allows her to boost Maha Velo up to 3050 attack off one card. Card. She can then boost the attack of her monsters further with cards like Metal Morph and the field spell Luminous Spark, the latter of which boosts the attack of all light monsters by 500, but at the cost of reducing their defense by 400. Going off the deck alone, this might be one of our most difficult looking opponents so far, but I'm sure with the right hand we can send this Great Keeper packing. We get to go first, and our opening hand has Alligator Sword, Battle Steer, Lava Battle Guard, Time Wizard, Raigeki, and Heavy Storm. We don't have much in terms of cards that can protect us from Ashizu's monsters, however, with Alligator Sword being exactly 50 attack weaker than an unequipped Maha Velo. As such, I decided to pass turn with no cards on the field. We set a monster on our following turn, with us getting hit directly by Duname's Dark Witch two turns in a row. While we're still stressed for good monsters to get on board, with our draw for turn being Red Eyes Black Dragon, I decided not to use Raigeki, as I feel it's a bit too early to do that and still win. So I instead opt for Time Wizard to decide the future of this duel. And somehow we were able to get the coin toss we needed and poke Ashizu for 500 damage. While Time Wizard doesn't last long, thanks in part to Neo the Magic Swordsman, when Ashizu gets another monster on board, I go for the Raigeki there, destroying both Neo and Maha Velo. We then summon Alligator Sword, ship away at another 1500 of her life points, and set a Magic Jammer before passing turn. Ashizu then activates Mystical Space Typhoon on our Magic Jammer, and since I don't see us getting it out of our hand any other way, I chain the trap card just to send Red Eyes to the grave for a monster reborn later. Afterwards, she follows up with Luminous Spark and sets a monster. Huh. With Luminous Spark active, her strongest wall becomes 1600 defense, though Shining Angel being a set would really ruin our day here. Regardless, I attribute Alligator Sword for Battle Steer and prove the AI to be more artificial than intelligent, as it's Banisher of the Light set, letting us get over the monster. From here, we pretty much have Ashizu unlocked for the rest of the duel. After setting a Hoshin Ingen, which we destroy, Ashizu sets one final trap card. We're able to Heavy Storm it, revealing it not to be Exchange of the Spirit, but instead Metal Morph. And from here, we're able to summon a monster stronger than any Egyptian god in the game, Beaver Warrior letting us once again defeat an opponent with exact lethal. 
Saving the two most iconic characters for last, next up is the final antagonist of the Duel Monsters anime and manga, Yami Bakura. Uh, spoilers, I guess. The Thief King doesn't have a deck all too different from what we've seen so far, but rather a fairly generic one. There's a fair balance of beat sticks, battle tricks, and flip monsters, with our only new card here being Masked Sorcerer, a 900 attack monster that lets Bakora draw a card when it inflicts battle damage. It's sort of a reverse white magical hat, if you will. Worth noting, though, that it's strange how between the first duel with Bakora and here, Dark Elf isn't present, despite that arguably being one of the better cards he had. Then again, I'm... Glad I don't have to see that thing again. Otherwise, not much else to say here. It's the greatest hits of some of the game's more tricky cards, so let's see if this vengeful spirit can back us into a corner like his host did in Stage 1. Beginning the duel, we get to go first, and our hand is loaded with back row cards, but only the Kaganangan we can summon, with the other monster in our group being a Swamp Battle Guard. Given my concern that we might not draw another summonable monster potentially, I decided to take the Mirror Force from our opener on Bakora's first Vorse Raider. It's a one-for-one -one trade, sure, but I felt Board Presence to be exceptionally important in this situation. Luckily, we do end up drawing a Tariki next. I decided not to use Swamp Battle Guard here and instead summon the Tariki, just so Bakora has more monsters to chew through with his spot removal cards. So, we use both of our monsters to get in for 2,000 damage and pass it back to Bakora. And almost as if right on cue, Bakora summons DD Warrior, banishing both it and Kaganingen in the process. While we end up drawing Panther Warrior on our following turn, I opt to play a bit more conservatively, summoning it but only attacking directly with Tariki to keep it as material for later. This proves to be the wrong call, however, as Bakora activates Raigeki, clearing our board of monsters. Luckily, though, Bakora only summons a Dream Clown, and we're able to top deck an Alligator Sword on our following turn, which serves as our out to it. After getting in a bit of damage by using Change of Heart on our Alligator Sword and swinging in with both it and Wall of Illusion, we play a bit of a defensive back and forth from this point. Attacking over the Wall of Illusion bounces back our Alligator Sword, which we're able to resummon in main phase 2, only for Record to hit over it with Gemini L. While we take a gamble in not using Raigeki here, it ultimately pays off as Bakora chooses to set a monster on his following turn, with the Gemini Elf bringing us down to 1600 life points. Drawing the 13th grave, I decide to Raigeki here and bring Bakora down to 2800 life points. I figured that since he set a monster last turn, his hand is probably starting to run out of gas. And this does appear to be the case, as it prompts Bakora to activate Swords of Revealing Light, setting a monster in one of his back row cards before passing turn. Though we try to threaten the Swords of Heavy Storm, the set Magic Jammer Bakora has ensures we're to wait out these three turns. Thankfully though, while Bakora's only able to set up a Summon Skull in a back row this time, we manage to consistently keep a monster on board as well as get a Summon Skull of our own and change of heart to hand. Stealing Bakora's Summon Skull, we tribute it for a Summon Skull of our own, set Hitatsumi Giant to ensure we don't get blown out by Mirror Force, and attempt to get in for damage, only to be met with a Karibo in hand which blocks our attack. No worries though, as thankfully Bakora's next turn only has him setting a monster, which, after summoning our Axe Raider and attacking into it, we find out it's Magician of Faith, and while this does get him back right Geki, with us having 4100 damage on board, it's a little too late for the Dark Spirit of the Millennium Ring. Maybe you should have stuck to the old deck, Bakora. And that takes us to the final two duelists of Stage 4, so before we face off against the Pharaoh, we'll be taking on the other contender for the King of Games title, Seto Kaiba. Unsurprisingly, Kaiba's deck has a high volume of dragon monsters, some requiring tributes like Hazan Ryu and Twin-Headed Fire Dragon, but all pale in comparison to the three copies of Blue-Eyes White Dragon he possesses. Fortunately for us, Kaiba doesn't have much in the way of getting the resources on board to conveniently summon them, with the exception of Cyberjar, which we're more than familiar with at this point, but also two copies of Nimble Mamanga. When it's destroyed by battle, the controller gains 1,000 life points and may then summon any number of itself from the deck face down. Odd that he only runs two, since it's a fairly competent card for swarming the board, but I guess Kaiba really needed that third copy of Komori Dragon. In any case, this whole explanation of the new cards in Kaiba's deck is completely irrelevant, as really only one card here matters, and people familiar with Cybernetic Revolution format here in the TCG probably noticed one card I've yet to bring up. While Kaiba doesn't run any copies of Polymerization like we do, he is the only duelist in the game to make use of the extra deck with one single copy of Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon. This 4500 attack behemoth is normally made by fusing together three copies of the Blue-Eyes White Dragon, however, this can be entirely circumvented with the real danger this deck poses. Cyberstein. At the cost of a whopping 5000 life points, Cyberstein allows the user to special summon a fusion monster from the extra deck. This ultimately means that at any point in the duel, should Kaiba meet the necessary conditions, we may end up staring down the vanilla beatstick to end all vanilla beatsticks. As a result, the 700 attack Cyberstein would be our only immediate way of getting damage in, should we be without a means of removing the three-headed dragon. As an extra layer of unintentional protection, since Cyberstein special summons the fusion monster and doesn't fusion summon it, even if we destroy Blue-Eyes Ultimate Dragon, something like Monster Reborn can't bring it back from the graveyard since it wasn't summoned properly. That all being said, let's see if we can give Joey the revenge he deserves and take down Kaiba's powerful engine of destruction. We go first and our opening hand is honestly not spectacular. 
While we have Change of Heart available for tribute plays with Summon Skull, we also drew the Red Eyes and a bunch of normal monsters we can't really make the best use of. So, setting Tiger X, Kaiba is able to get over it with Force Raider, and while we could probably stall some, letting Kaiba get in a few direct hits could quickly put us slightly under 5,000 life points, which would leave us open to an OTK from our position. Because of this, I opt to go for the Change of Heart play I just mentioned, taking Voice Raider and tributing it for Summon Skull. However, the small amount of direct damage this provides would prove to be short-lived as Kaiba responds with Raigeki. After trading Komori Dragon for our Dragon Zombie, Kaiba sets a monster, which we attack into with Alligator Sword, being Nimble Mamanga. Chewing through both gives us the board presence, but returns Kaiba 2,000 of his life points, putting him at 74,000 total. This move would prove to be a fatal mistake on our end, as Kaiba brings out Cyberstein and consequently the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. After laying waste to our Alligator Sword, we set Baby Dragon and attack over Cyberstein to hopefully get in a bit of extra damage. While the situation here is dire, if I'm able to survive one additional turn, drawing something like a Regeki or Mirror Force could still win us the game. Kaiba quickly dashes these hopes by summoning Hoshin Ingen, boosting Blue Eyes to 5,000 attack, and getting in the extra little bit of damage he needed to knock us out of the game. To say that went poorly would be an understatement, but at least there's attempt two. Well, at least Kaiba's straight to the point about kicking our ass, unlike some of the other duelists here. And so Kaiba's the second duelist so far to bring us up to three attempts. At this point, I'm pretty conscious about the dangers posed in giving him the battle phase, so I instead elect to go second this time. This prompts Kaiba to simply set a monster, set a backer card, and pass it on over to us. And with what all he has, it could quite literally be anything. Fortunately for us, our hand is fairly balanced with three normal summonable monsters, change of heart, and a graceful charity to fix our hand should we need it. Since all of Kaiba's level 4 or lower monsters only have 1200 defense max, I summon Baby Dragon to check for a set Solemn Judgment and attack into his set monster, which we find out to be probably the worst card it could be for us. Cyberjar. Destroying the board, it gets for us Monster Reborn, Swamp Battle Guard, a Panther Warrior which we set, Battle Steer, and Sword of Dragon Soul. Kaiba, however, draws into Harpy's Feather Duster, Mystical Space Typhoon, Blue Eyes White Dragon, Raigeki, and Force Raider, which he summons. This gives him all the board clearing cards he could ever want, much to my horror. After discarding some of our weaker monsters at end phase, Kaiba of course Raigeki's our Panther Warrior away, but then proceeds to turn a bad situation even worse for us by summoning out Cyberstein once again and bringing down that godforsaken Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon once more. After swinging in for a little over 7,000 damage, Kaiba sets a spell trap and passes back over to us. While the situation for us looks exceptional, dire, with how many spells we have in our grip, I begin to think about our position more rationally and realize it's entirely winnable from here. The new set card is likely the Mystical Space Typhoon Kaiba drew off Cyberjar, and the old set is probably not a solemn judgment. Even if it was, with the Cyberstein still on the field, using it now would be a dangerous mistake. I also rationalize it's probably not Mirror Force since I feel he would have used it on Baby Dragon back during turn 2. The only card left to check is Magic Jammer. After normal summoning Axe Raider and equipping it with Sword of Dragon's Soul, Kaiba elects to not negate the equip spell. I then fire a Graceful Charity, hoping to find our Heavy Storm and get some peace of mind, but no dice there either. Even though my better judgment is telling me that, by all accounts, that set card is nothing to worry about, part of me still fears that the AI here is actually doing something smart and saving its strongest cards for a serious threat. Regardless, it's not something I can simply let dictate the outcome of this duel, and I'm certainly not going to psych myself into thinking the AI is being smart. If this duel is going to end, it will be on my terms. Activating Change of Heart, we take to our side of the field the card that's both Kaiba's greatest strength but also his greatest weakness. The Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon! With no other options, we go to battle! Attack into Cyberstein, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, and end this duel! As powerful as Kaiba's Cyberstein combo was, it falls all the same to this third-rate duelist with a fourth-rate deck. And with that, we come to the final duelist of Stage 4, the Spirit of the Millennium Puzzle, and the face of the franchise himself, Yami Yugi. While the Pharaoh's deck is better than Little Yugi's from a strictly surface-level point of view, it's definitely not the best. Yami Yugi's deck basically takes the generic good cards we've seen so far as a core, and then throws together as many iconic cards as possible. 
Of the interesting new cards here that might pose a threat, Big Shield Garda is a 2600 defense monster that doesn't require a tribute to set. The caveat being that if it's attacked, it's switched to attack position, of which it only has 100 attack to defend itself with. Otherwise, a key takeaway here is how exceptionally prone to bricking this deck appears to be, with no cohesive strategy. With double Dark Magician, Summon Skull, Dark Magician Girl, and one Buster Blader, he runs a total of 7 tribute monsters without any swarming cards to facilitate them. A chunk of his deck which could have gone into incorporating beat sticks also went into running each of these significantly weaker Magnet Warrior cards in order to attempt to facilitate Valkyrion the Magna Warrior, a high attack monster with a special summon requirement that's virtually impossible to pull off, especially at the point of this game's history. The Zelda King of Mythical Beasts is in here too because, hey, that's a card Yugi used. And then anti Ragaki and Whitehall for his super niche counters, one of which we don't even play. So yeah, in total, that's around 14 cards in this deck that are arguably dead from the get-go should you draw them. It's a bold strategy if you could call it that, but who knows, maybe some Egyptian magic and protagonist powers can propel Yugi to victory here. Fortunately for us, our protagonist powers seem to have kicked in. Going first, our opening hand contains Pot of Greed, Magic Jammer, and Raigeki, as well as three normal summonable monsters we can use from the get-go. Setting Beaver Warrior and Magic Jammer, I use Pot of Greed to thin out the deck some before passing back to Yugi. And Yugi starts off his turn by firing off Harpy's Feather Duster to which I let resolve since I'm not particularly pressed about discarding any of the cards in my hand currently. The AI then does its best Eldritch impersonation by setting three back row and passing back to us. No monsters, eh? We summon Alligator Sword and attack with it alone, baiting out the Mirror Force while letting us keep the Beaver Warrior. Fortunately, passing on just Beaver Warrior has no negative repercussions for us, as Yugi simply passes the turn as soon as we pass it back to him. At this point, I have a few guesses as to what his hand might look like right now. In any case, after getting in a bit of damage, Yugi's finally able to set a monster on his following turn, only for us to find out it was Big Shield Gardener and exploit his nasty allergy to being poked by beavers. This lets us get an even more damage next turn, and considering we still have Raigeki in our grip, I have my doubts Gemini Elf will be able to get him out of this mess, should he have it. But that's a possibility we won't even need to address, as Yugi passes turn on no new cards, letting us clean up the game from here with X Raider and Alligator Sword. Some King of Games he was. And at last, we come to the final level in the game, Stage 5. Unlike the previous stages, this one only has four new opponents for us to face, as opposed to the usual five. And on top of that, apart from the dual computer, we need to unlock the other three. But we can cross that bridge when we get there. For now, let's see how the true embodiment of the AI fares against our deck. Despite claiming to have a deck matched against ours for optimal performance, the dual computer simply plays a mashup of all the flip monsters and hand control cards we've seen so far, giving us the game's final revision of a more degenerate playstyle. Of the new cards here is Gravekeeper Servant, a continuous spell that requires we send the top card of our deck to the graveyard in order to declare an attack. Not too much of a threat given the high density of weak monsters we have to mill, but given the deck has no real way of protecting itself from back removal, it's probably best we just wait to draw a heavy storm before pushing for damage. The other new card is Ring of Destruction. This exceptionally powerful trap card lets you target a monster on the field destroy it, and burn both players for damage equal to its attack. As a result of its burn effect, however, it's also one of the few cards which can easily force the game to end in a draw. Unsurprisingly nowadays, it has an errata that makes it virtually unplayable, because even Konami seems to frown upon that kind of degeneracy. Anyway, not much else to say here. It's the final version of a deck we're all too familiar with at this point. Let's put a stop to Morphing Jar once and for all, shall we? Going first, this duel plays out like most of our addings against mill decks so far. A slow game of back and forth while setting all of our spells and traps in order to play around hand destruction. Eventually, after getting four set monsters on the board though, we're able to change of heart on a set Magician of Faith, letting us chain it into a second change of heart, which deals us a set Morphing Jar. From here, we tribute our Baby Dragon and Magician of Faith for Red Eyes Black Dragon, and Morphing Jar to turn our one card remaining in hand into five. Despite our advantage snowballing as it did, our hesitation to push with Raigeki leads the duel computer to clean up the entire board with Dark Hole, and from there they regain control of the duel. While we're able to hang in just a bit longer with our remaining monsters and traps, a Ring of Destruction activated on our Summoned Skull is just enough to finish us off completely. In stark contrast to this, our next attempt goes much better. With Change of Heart and Mirror Force in our grip, along with two normal summonable monsters, we're able to keep the computer off its beat sticks for most of the duel. Even bring back the Bistro Butcher with Call of the Haunted as a vain effort, as this just allows us to steal it with Change of Heart and tribute it for Summon Skull, which lets us get in for 2,500 damage. Trading blow for blow, Raigeki is able to clear out our Summon Skull, but a correctly called Time Wizard along with a Monster Reborn drawn off the top lets us hit directly for another 3,000. While a Monster Reborn of their own brings back Mystic Horseman, hesitancy to attack into Time Wizard lets us tribute him for Swamp Battle Guard and clean up the game from here. All that's missing is for the cards to start bouncing around like we just finished a game of Solitaire. Even though we got a win against the dual computer and shaved off like 10 minutes from the first attempt, I wasn't satisfied with the near perfect luck required to pull that off, so I wanted to try a different, more interesting strategy. But first, we need to talk about Flip Monsters. 
One thing I haven't brought attention to in both this and the previous video is that the AI has a tendency to not use its flip monsters against us proactively. This means if the monster has a flip effect, it'll often wait for us to attack into it rather than flipping it to attack position itself. An exception to this rule being Maneater Bug, which it will occasionally flip to destroy a monster. With this detail in mind, however, along with the fact that the AI loves to play whatever monster it has in its hand at any given point, we can take advantage of the Bistro Butcher being its only card that proactively mills us out of the game and attempt to deck our opponent out. So I rematched the dual computer with Joey's deck and found that yes, if you go second and are able to keep Gemini Elf, White Magical Hat, and the Bistro Butcher from pressuring your life points, it's entirely possible to make them run out of cards in deck. Hell, I was under so little pressure after clearing out their attackers that I was even able to summon out Thousand Dragon and Red-Eyes Black Dragon before letting them draw themselves into oblivion. So yeah, if you're considering taking the Joey challenge yourselves and want a more consistent win condition, maybe consider this an option for taking on the dual computer instead of how I originally handled the fight. Anyway, though we've beaten the dual computer, that isn't the criteria for unlocking our next opponent. Instead, we'll need to get ourselves a copy of the card, Toon World. Thankfully, that isn't too difficult for us to accomplish, as entering its password lets us acquire it with ease. And, as expected, this unlocks the creator of dual monsters himself, Maximilian Pegasus. And Pegasus' deck is certainly one of the more unique ones in this tier, as no, your eyes do not deceive you, he is the only duelist in the game to run 41 cards as opposed to 40. Otherwise, for the deck itself, it contains an engine of Toon World, Toon Summon Skull, Mongari Ran, and Blue Eyes Toon Dragon. To elaborate real quick, these monsters require that Toon World be on the field to special summon for tributes, as if they are being tribute summoned, they cannot attack the turn they're summoned, and they require a 500 life point payment in order to attack. On the plus side, they get to attack directly if we don't control a Toon monster, and unfortunately for us, Toon Red Eyes wouldn't be for a good decade and a half after this game came out. Anyway, with a card like Megamorph, which doubles the attack of a monster if the controller's life points are less than their opponents, this makes Summon Skull and Blue Eyes especially dangerous, getting them to either 5,000 or 6,000 respectively. Regardless, all of these restrictions compounded with the fact that Toon World being destroyed destroys them as well, they aren't going to be a major worry for us. Speaking of Toon World though, the written text just simply states that it's activated by paying 1,000 life points, but this is actually something of a misnomer. This is the errata text for Toon World that we in the TCG received for our first printing, but the card here runs off of its original OCG effect which has a few additional caveats. While Toon World is on the field, the controller must pay 500 life points during each of their standby phases, but if the card is destroyed, all of the life points paid for Toon World, including the initial activation, are regained. Really though, if this gets played, I wouldn't be surprised if Pegasus just burns him out of the game here if I'm being perfectly honest. But we're not done yet. As expected, Relinquished is here, along with its associated ritual spell, Black Illusion Ritual. This lets Pegasus equip any of our monsters to this monstrosity, so long as it doesn't already have one equipped, gaining its stats and protecting his ritual from one-time battle destruction. Quite the headache to deal with, for sure. And Dark Eyes Illusionist is our final new card here worth mentioning, but not by much. When it's flipped face up, that can prevent a monster from attacking, so long as it's face up on the field. But with stats Alligator's Sword can get over, I don't see him lasting too long in any circumstance. Also, before we finally begin the duel, I'd just like to point out that Pegasus runs 3 Red Archery Girl despite the fact it has a Toon counterpart which is in the game and is significantly better. Weird. In any case, our duel with Pegasus starts out pretty eventful with Raigeki, Change of Heart, and Magical Arm Shield in our opening rip. This is compounded by a Cyber Jar activation, flooding both of our boards with monsters. We're able to knock out Nimble Momonga by forcing it to attack into Pegasus' Rogue Doll with Magical Arm Shield, Summoning two more Mamanga, but since Rogue Doll cannot return to Pegasus, it gets destroyed too. Pegasus is able to Raigeki us on the following turn and attack directly with a bunch of monsters, but realizing how perilous it would be to face tank all of that damage, I use Skull Dice after Sinister Serpent attacks to reduce the total to 2,300. On our turn, the Change of Heart Monster Reborn combo lets us get both of our Battle Guards on field and push over the last Nimble Mamanga and Sinister Serpent. Pegasus counters this with Swords of Revealing Light and Black Illusion Ritual, letting him steal our Lava Battle Guard with Relinquished and attack over Swamp Battle Guard with Force Raider. After a failed Time Wizard, we set Mirror Force and Pegasus takes the bait, letting us wipe his board clean. From here, Pegasus' deck all but runs out of gas and we're able to steadily push over his reoccurring Sinister Serpent to get to his remaining life points. Millennia Mine, you still can predict those moves? I guess Pegasus just peered into our mind and saw nothing but static anyways. So with Pegasus down, who's next? Well, in order to unlock our next opponent, we have to win the in-game National Tournament which takes place in November, with our save file starting in January. Oh boy. A day passes for each duel, so after surrendering to stage 1 duels for what was probably a little over 100 times, we're able to cleanly sweep the tournament with a mill deck I put together for fun, and unlock the third stage 5 opponent, Simon Moran, the chief advisor of Pharaoh Attempts Court. While this deck is what I would consider a beatdown control hybrid deck, the Yu-Gi-Oh! Phantom Wiki instead classifies it as the ultimate cookie deck. 
so I'll just go with that instead. The only new cards here are Muka Muka and Total Defense Shogun. The former is a 2-star monster that gains 300 attack and defense for each card in the owner's hand. That's pretty scary with how much draw power is available in this format. As for Total Defense Shogun, it's a tribute monster with low attack and high defense, but with the gimmick that it can declare an attack while in defense position. It's sort of like a predecessor to the Super Heavy Samurai archetype from the Arc 5 era, only here damage is still calculated with the attack values. So, the duel itself begins with us going second, and much like with the duel computer, it's a slow game of chicken between myself and Simon, with a lot of powerful cards in our grip throughout the course of the game. After several uneventful turns, Simon is able to tribute for Total Defense Shogun, and weirdly enough chooses to switch him to attack position. Regardless of this odd blunder, we don't have anything to beat over at this point in the duel apart from summoning Baby Dragon and hoping for a high roll off Skull Dice. Thankfully, rolling a 4, we're able to get just that, allowing us to later fire off in sequence Heavy Storm to remove Mirror Force, Regeki to wipe away Simon's 4 monsters, and then Monster Reborn to bring back the Shogun for ourselves. However, with most of our high impact cards used up at this point, all it takes to push us completely out of the duel is Cyberjar summoning out his Panther Warriors, a Witch of the Black Forest, and Muka Muka with a grip full of cards. Granted, I could have probably called Time Wizard here, but with Swords of Revealing Light also present, I don't see this as having been winnable from here, other than risking Time Wizard on the Cyberjar itself. Oh well, maybe the second run will go a bit better. And while the first one was interesting for how high impact the plays were near the end, this one's a perfect demonstration of just how broken the AI can be. Summoning an 1800 Muka Muka compounded with a set card, Simon's able to threaten our board pretty hard, and because of this we fire off Skull Dice in our turn so that we can take it out with Axe Raider. And in case the set back row is a Mirror Force, we use Heavy Storm to check for it, but in a turn of events that would ultimately seal Simon's fate, it would turn out to be Imperial Order. While under normal circumstances this would be catastrophic for us, we have to keep in mind how the Espa duel back in Part 1 went. Back then, Espa attempted to use Change of Heart under IO, meaning that the AI doesn't exist exactly have the best grasp on how the card works. And this would be quickly proven to be true as well, as after knocking out Muka Muka, the AI attempts to activate Swords of Revealing Light, keeping it on the field, but negated. Not realizing this, Simon summons Cannon Soldier before passing turn, probably thinking he's safe to do so under Swords of Revealing Light. Meanwhile, we're able to keep a steady stream of monsters on board, poking at his life points while making sure he's still able to pay for Imperial Order. And to conclude this duel, Simon's final turn will be spent attempting to activate Dark Hole and Graceful Charity, thinking they can turn the board state back around, before simply conceding to setting a monster. While the thought of Cyberjar lurked in my head, it would turn out to be just another Panther Warrior, which we were quick to dispose of before bringing an end to this duel proper. And by dueling Simon, not only do we gain access to one copy of every card in the game, but the final duelist in the game as well, Yugi's Grandpa, Solomon Moto, or Truesdale as the really bad localization for this game refers to him. As probably expected by anyone who's at least seen memes of the series, Grandpa's deck contains the unstoppable Exodia, building the entire strategy around it. And unexpectedly, this deck does in fact contain some pathetic cards to differentiate it from a few other Exodia lists we've seen up until this point. More specifically, in an attempt to punish the player for not playing aggressively into cards like Sangin and Witch of the Black Forest, Blue Eyes White Dragon is in here, I guess he managed to tape it back together after episode 1, along with a copy of Summon Skull. Gazelle the King of Mythical Beasts is also here as a carryover from Yami Yugi's deck, and Big Eye is a flip monster that, when flipped face up, lets the controller rearrange the top 5 cards of their deck in any order. Otherwise, it's a bunch of power cards you've come to expect at this point, along with the extremely specific Raigeki and Dark Hole counters, so we'll still have to be on our toes some with this duel. So, the last duel begins and Solomon goes first. Right off the bat with the stall cards, he sets a monster and fires Swords of Revealing Light, keeping us from attacking for 3 turns. This would hold true, as while our opening hand has a few spells and traps to work with, Heavy Storm just isn't in our grip, even after Graceful Charity fetches us Change of Heart and Magic Jammer. We draw Mirror Force for turn, and begin setting up our board by summoning Axe Raider and placing down Magical Arm Shield and Magic Jammer. Grandpa Mudo follows this up by attacking over our Axe Raider with Gemini Elf and setting a backer before passing back to us. Top decking into Hero of the East, we begin to play defensively, setting him and hoping we can keep him with Magical Arm Shield. Fortunately, after summoning Witch of the Black Forest, we're able to prevent the destruction of our hero by stealing Gemini Elf with Magical Arm Shield, destroying Witch in the process. Strangely enough, he searches for Summon Skull rather than an Exodia piece, but hey, I'm not complaining. Piling onto our board presence, we call out Dragon Zombie and set Mirror Force. If all goes well, we should start pressing for damage next turn as Sword expires during the end phase. Mystical Elf is summoned to attack, but Mirror Force is able to wipe the board, Sangen searching out a backup Mystical Elf on destruction. Drawing into Red Eyes, we go straight to battle and attack with Dragon Zombie, baiting out any potential Mirror Force that Grandpa might have. Luckily, this is not the case, and he just activates Pot of Greed before setting a monster in back row. We draw a Pot of Greed on our own and activate it, baiting out the set magic Jammer, however, this was planned for as we're able to then activate Change of Heart. This lets us steal the set Mystical Elf and tribute it along with Hero of the East for Red Eyes Black Dragon. After dealing 4,000 direct damage total, our opponent concedes the duel by immediately passing turn back to us. And so we close this duel and the challenge as a whole with one final direct attack Red Eyes Inferno Fire Blast!
And that's the game, folks. So, is it possible to beat Yu-Gi-Oh! Eternal Duel of Soul using only Joey's deck from stage one of the game? Well, with a bit of luck and human ingenuity, surprisingly, yes! At first, I was skeptical about how viable the deck would be against opponents with far more solidly put together strategies, but as we found out, the AI opponents piloting these decks weren't exactly the most well designed. Most of the late game duels boiled down to exploiting a quirk on how the AI worked, especially opponents using flip monsters and Imperial Order specifically. The two opponents that gave us the most trouble here are Kana and Seto Kaiba, both used decks that were very aggressive and simple to pilot. This, of course, required more of our deck's blowout cards in order to really stop them in their tracks. And for the keen eyed, you might have also noticed that both of these opponents required change of heart in some capacity to turn the the duel in our favor. This is because, paradoxically, the best tools in our strategy for beating them were the cards in their own decks. That all being said, we have finally reached the end of this video. Thank you all for watching, and I'd just like to give a shout out to the especially warm response for part one. I wasn't quite expecting that one to take off as quickly as it did, but it gave me the motivation to put more effort into this video for sure. Anyway, the next video probably won't be Yu-Gi-Oh related, as I'd like to branch out into more of the games I hold close to my heart, but I'll certainly be returning to the world of duel monsters in the future. So on that note, this has been Stupid Studios in, signing out. Ciao.